Hello and welcome to Focus on the Bible. I am so glad that you are listening. I want to begin by inviting you this morning to our services at Eastside. Meet at 9 o'clock for worship, followed by Bible classes at 9.30 for all ages, and then at 10.30 for a second period of worship. In addition, we meet at 7 on Wednesday evenings for Bible class. We'd love to have you come and visit with us soon. Today's focus on the Bible is the continuation of a lesson presented by Brother D. Bowman on August 6, 2006. Brother Bowman was a gospel preacher for more than 50 years. He passed away this last week. In his memory and honor, I want to present this lesson of his. He was a powerful preacher, and he has gone on to his reward. This lesson is titled, The Importance of Attitude, and I hope that you will listen well to Brother D. Bowman. We must have the right attitude toward God, but we must have the right attitude toward ourselves. That's very fundamental. Listen to what he says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of grace, of faith. For as we have many members, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Could I ask you a question? Where do you fit in that? Where do you fit? That's what you have to have, is the right attitude toward yourself. I, I just deplore the fact that we have to have a spirit of competition among ourselves. If we're not qualified to be an elder, we look with disdain upon those that are. If we're not qualified to lead the songs, we're highly critical of those that do the song leading. When in reality, what we need to do is begin at the beginning, which says, let every man among you be careful that he doesn't think more highly of himself than he ought to think. We ought to see ourselves as having little or no value at all when we're divorced from our relationship to Jesus Christ. That is absolutely necessary. We begin with the spirit of humility. Humility is that. It's, it's hard to get. The minute you say you got it, you lost it. You say, I'm humble. No, not anymore. <laughs> You're done bragging about it. I heard about a fellow that worked in one of the plants down in Houston. He got the uh, award for being the most humble man at the plant. Then they took it away from him because he accepted it. You can't do that. So <laughs> Humility is one of the really hard things. And I think what makes it hard is that we've labored under kind of a misconception about what humility is, what is. We think it's, it's a guy that goes down with his chin down like that all the time and just looks up at people this way. It, it does have a kind of a downward trend toward it, but that's not, the, that's not humility. Humility, ladies and gentlemen, is an attitude. It's an attitude. And what it says is that I have no value without Jesus Christ. And what it says, Lord, you tell me what to do and I will do it. You speak to God to ask Him to make you all that you can become, and you become humble. You don't get up some morning and say, I'm going to be humble today. You get up some morning and you say, I'm going to do what God told me to do today, and you become humble. That's humility. And we need that so desperately. And He says, we need everybody. He said, God has given grace, gifts, if you please, and I understand that perhaps these are spiritual gifts, but I'm not particularly in, uh, interested in where the gift came from. Be it one of these gifts and these people that had it by a direct manifestation of the Holy Spirit, or be it gifts that are given by some sort of genetic thing. It's still the same attitude that you use to manage the gifts. Our attitude must be the same as those who had the gifts from some other way. He says, having gifts differing. Every man uses gift for the whole. Everybody fits somewhere. We just need to stay where we fit. My dad was a tailor. He ordered clothes for many, many years from the old National Tailoring Company in Chicago. He could measure you for a suit, and when that suit came, it would fit just exactly. And he would tell you right quick, like, that things wear out where they don't fit. When we have trouble among one another, it's most of the time somebody is out of place. 
somebody is not where he fits. We must not try to fit where we don't fit. But the other side of that is, we must fit where we do fit. Let us not forget that we're all important. Listen to me. There are no big preachers and little preachers. I deplore that. There are no part-time preachers and full-time preachers. If a man preaches, he preaches. But I want to say to you that preachers need no more recognition than anybody else. We're all just Christians who preach. Please hear me. We are Christians first and we preach. And so we need to understand that we just need to get where we fit. And he says, if you're an exhorter, man, you be the best exhorter that you can. And if you're a teacher, you be the best teacher you can be. And if you're one who gives diligence with something else, if you're one who rules like an elder, then you do the best job you can. Then we need to have a right attitude toward others. He says in verse 10, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continue instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. And he goes through verse 15 by saying, Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. How's your attitude toward other people? Are you able to rejoice with little Johnny's mother when the little Johnny receives an honor and you didn't receive an honor? Are you able to do that? Are you able to weep with them that weep? We do a better job of weeping with them that weep than we do with rejoicing with them that rejoice. But we have to do both. We have to do both. And I'll tell you how you do that. He said, be kindly affectioned one toward another. Are you aware, ladies and gentlemen, that our English word kin is akin to our word kind? That's where we get the word. If you're in the body of Christ, you're of the same kind and if you're of the same kind, you're kin to one another. Because kindredness is kindness. I can give you all kinds of definitions for kindness. Sometimes it, it means benign. Sometimes it means useful. Sometimes it just means favorable. But in the real essence of the word, it means kin. It means you treat somebody like you're kin to them. You don't mark off your kinship, do you? No, even if you have a little trouble, you'll try to work it all out because you're kin, you see. And we are kin. We are spiritually kindred. We are kin to one another, and we ought to have the highest sort of kindred kinship. I have people among my people in God that are much closer to me than my own blood kin because we are spiritually connected we are spiritually kin to one another. And he said, be kindly affectioned one to another. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in your business. Rejoicing, serving the Lord. Patient, distributing to one another. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Be of the same mind one toward another. What a wonderful thought that is. He says, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. That's so important. Don't let your mind dwell on being somebody. Condescend. That's humility again. It's not saying I'm humble. It's condescending to help somebody. It's bending down. There is no more beautiful thing, ladies and gentlemen, than somebody who helps somebody who doesn't have to. That's true philanthropy. Be not wise in your own conceits. If you have some special talent, Relish in it, but relish in the use of it for the good of the whole. Relish in the use of it for somebody else. Bend down to help somebody. Lower yourself to the attitude that is characteristic of one who understands that he has opportunities and has obligations as a result of the opportunities. And then he gives us a real strong thing to look at about our attitude toward opposition. If you're going to live in this world and you're going to take a stand for the truth, you're going to have opposition. Even inside the Lord's body, you'll have opposition at times. And he says in that regard, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide all things honorable in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Did you, did you notice that he accedes to the possibility that you can't do it? That's what he's saying. 
But he says, don't recompense evil for evil. You know what? That's hard. That's really hard. Because when somebody does something to you, retaliation is the first thing you think about. I'm going to get him for that. You can't do that. You can't do that and be a Christian. You can't do that and present yourself a living sacrifice to God. You can't do that and be the part that God expects you to be. You can't do that toward others and be pleasing to God. Jesus did not do that. He never recompensed evil for evil. And He lived in a culture that should have given Him every right to do so because nobody has ever been so defamed in such a despicable fashion as was the Lord of glory. And yet He never retaliated in kind. See Him there, ladies and gentlemen. See Him there, suspended between God and man on Golgotha's rugged height, nailed to a cross. And see Him looking down on fallen mankind and not calling down ten legions of angels, but saying in a hushed and dying voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What kind of Savior is that? It's what we should be like. He says, as much as in your life, live peaceably with all men. Avenge not yourself. Give place to rest. It is written, I will take care of it. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Do you, do you know why? If I'm the one who meets out the vengeance, I won't be very hard on Brother Ed because he's my friend. But somebody that doesn't like me, and I know he doesn't like me, I'll do too much. God will do what's right. He's the one to take care of vengeance. He's the one who is totally omnipotent, totally omniscient, all-knowing and all-powerful. He will mete out the judgment that is appropriate to the crime. We need to bear that in mind. Now, you have a right to be mad at somebody. And I'll tell you how long you can do that. Just exactly how long. Paul says to the Ephesians, Let not the sun go down on your wrath. That means you have about 12 hours in daylight savings time to be mad at somebody. Let not, what, what, do you, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, what a different world it would be if nobody ever stayed mad more than 12 hours. Can you imagine what that would be? If we started over every morning by presenting our bodies a living sacrifice to God, if we lived with an attitude toward ourselves like it ought to be, if we lived with an attitude toward others like it ought to be, and we said, okay, i just got about eight more hours, or just seven more hours to be mad. Oh, I've got to get rid of this by night. It'd be a different world, wouldn't it? God's ways work. They work. He says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing this, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That means you'll cause him to look to God and repent of being your enemy. And so we need to be careful how we treat one another. A culture that is swallowing up religion. We live in a culture that would really like to get rid of all sort of restraints. That would like to unbuckle morality and let it run free. That would like to have no rules and no regulations. Everybody doing what he feels is good in his own mind. That's the society that we live in. And in order to live in that society and still maintain our relationship with God, we're going to have to be right with God in our attitude. We're going to have to be right with ourselves in our attitude. We're going to have to be right with others in our attitude. And we're going to have to be right when people oppose us. If we have the right attitude and make the right choices, we're in the road to getting along in an increasingly difficult society. To hear this lesson in its entirety, please email me at focusonthebible at icloud.com that's Focus on the Bible at iCloud.com or send me a phone call or text at 256-349-8911. That's 256-349-8911. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day.